Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Coffee Talk. Here I am in the Transamerica building in San Francisco for a very special interview. There are few people in the world of real estate where their name goes outside of their markets. And uh, one of those people is Michael Schwo. And we're here in his uh, building, the Transamerica building, which just launched. And uh, we're going to talk about this building, of course, and all the other markets that he's involved in. Michael, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. Always great seeing you. You too. And thank you for traveling all the way to the West Coast. Well, I got so many amazing questions for you. You got so many things going on. And uh, I'm glad that we get to address all of this stuff because so much of the stuff, like we, like I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of developers tend to hone in on the markets that they're in. You are in New York, you're in Miami, you're in Chicago, you're in LA, you're in San Francisco. It's tough enough handling one market. Do you feel like you're spread very thin? So it's, it's a great question. Um, and I'll tell you why it's a great question because most developers try to focus on a market, but they do a bunch of different things in the market. Shva is a kid, we know each other for many years, and I think that if you look at the history of what I've done and what, and what we are continuing to do, we're very focused on, on what our mission is. And our mission is to elevate super prime real estate in order to elevate people's lives. It's not about one market or one type of asset or one type of building. We're focused on who the customer is because the mindset of the customer, of the high-end customer in San Francisco and the high-end customer in Chicago or in New York and Miami, is exactly the same. They eat at the same restaurant, they shop in the same stores, and they vacation in the same locations. So we're not trying to hit different customers in a single market. We're looking after our customer, but we're looking after them in different markets and in different asset classes. We also do hotels, residential, retail, and, and office. Has there been a case where you had a, a tenant or a client come in where they rented from you in multiple markets? It's a great question. So right now we have a tenant of ours from this building that's in San Francisco that's about to rent space from us in New York. Mm -hmm. Because again, they just saw what we did here. We completed this, we opened this building yesterday. We had a massive kind of uh, um, opening that really I think changed downtown San Francisco. And that tenant is right now has a lease out on two floors on one of our buildings in New York. Mm -hmm. So it's same tenant from- Same here. tenant. And then, uh, you know, this uh, building is obviously a major project for you. Just walking around the building with you, I can see your excitement about it. You had amazing people involved in it. Norman Foster, obviously, uh, you know, a legend who's come and you've re-gutted this building entirely. But this is, a, you know, it's an iconic building by itself as a standalone. And what you brought to it with all the different touches that, you know, with the renovation, it's been incredible. A lot of people are saying that you're changing the mood of San Francisco and the coverage that you've been getting from the local press here has been very favorable. They're, they're very excited to have you in this market. And you had your party and Norman Foster was here and Johnny Ives was here and the mayor and everybody else. Are you, uh, can you create this kind of excitement that you've created for the Transamerica building in your other markets? So let's start with the fact that yesterday was the most important day in my professional life. And you're the first person I'm speaking to after that. So first thing, it's, it's, it's you know, I find that, that you and I end up doing these conversations in really important milestones. Mm -hmm. The last time we sat and did a, a proper conversation was on Zoom yeah. through COVID. Yeah. And if you remember what I said to you, I said that, that you asked me what's gonna happen with COVID and I said that God promised that you know, many years ago to Noah after the flood that he's not gonna destroy the world again. So if that's the case, we know COVID is not gonna be the end of the world and we should be buying real estate. Yeah. We're sitting five years later, four and a half billion dollars of acquisitions, including this amazing building. And I think that, that that, you know, I have a belief and I follow that belief and there's always naysayers and always doubters as we know. But and I appreciate you saying that the local press has been very complimentary and it has, there's been 40 articles in the last 24 hours, yeah. all of them, all of them really giving us amazing compliments on how we're changing downtown. So you're asking, can we do it elsewhere? This is, this is an icon that is irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean that we can't do great things in other market, but there is no other building like the Transamerica Pyramid. There's maybe the Empire State Building or things of that nature, right. but that's basically it. Um, but this building has really, what we've done here has transformed and is transforming downtown San Francisco. And we could obviously talk through that exactly how that's happening you know in the past you mentioned that uh, you know if you're no matter where the market is if you're targeting the top two percent you're going to be fine right and that's that's been your attitude your whole career you've always targeted that like top 
two percent of the. It's a little bit less than two percent. It's it's like the one percent of the one percent, but that that's true is because that's the that's the target audience that I understand. When you asked me the question before, is are you spread too thin? I'm not spread too thin. The, the simple thing is I understand the mindset of our customer. Mm. I don't understand the mindset of different customers. That's why I don't you know I don't mess with things I don't understand. Because you're creating the product for yourself, basically. It, it's not for myself necessarily. It's it creating the product for a very focused customer. We have a bullseye. We know who the customer is. We know what they want, where they eat, where they sleep, where they vacation. And we create a product that is geared towards them. The nice thing about creating a product for the top echelon on the market is that there's no limit on price or rent. So this building, when I bought it, rents were between 60 foot to $100 a foot. Mm -hmm. It was owned by Transamerica Corporation. And that was before COVID. That was before COVID. Yeah. 97% occupancy in San Francisco. Today, probably San Francisco is in 65% occupancy as right. a market. So obviously the San Francisco market took a big hit. We've rented, the rents we're getting here are between 105 at the base and 275 at the top. We've signed six, five leases over 200 bucks a foot. We've signed three leases last week between 125 to 185 in the midsection of the building. These are rents that are three times the rents that, that were at the building when I bought the building. So the nice thing about addressing the top of the market is the fact that, that if you deliver the right product, the money's there and they'll pay, they'll pay a premium. But right. they're, very, they're very specific on what they want. What portion of the building is rented as of today? So we have approximately 70% rented. Um, a bunch of new leases. You know, the building has had a lot of turnover, which is what we expected because, again, when a tenant pays $50 and you tell them now we've done all this renovation, now it's $150, yeah. a lot of them can't, can't afford it. Some of them did. We just, renewed, we just did a lease at the top of the building for $200 a foot for a tenant that uh, the lease expired at $95 a foot. So some tenants have the ability, and obviously now that we finished the renovation, want to be here, but a lot of them just can't afford it. Do you feel like you could uh, create, uh, well, I, before we jump uh, from that, but uh, you know, in, in the co-star, it says the building's 50% at least. Okay, but that's, probably, that's, that's probably correct in the sense that when you look at the vacancies, we were probably at 50% with the new leases that are signed that are obviously not in Costa, we're at approximately 50% today. Yeah. We've had a lot of turnover. Right, but then so with the new leases, we're at, we're at 70%. At 70%. And by the way, I still expect some of the old tenants to vacate, mm -hmm. and we're working on, on some massive leases right now, um, but we, we the expectation is that by the end of next year, this building should be probably in the, um, in the high 80s between new tenants that are vacating and new tenants that we're gonna sign. Has San Francisco ever seen uh, $270 rents before? San Francisco, when I, so when I came to San Francisco, it's a great story, when I came to San Francisco, um, we hired, we hired the, the leasing brokers, and I asked them, what's the highest rent in, in San Francisco? They told me it's 130 bucks a foot. I said, okay. I said, well, you know, I want 150 at the top of the building. He told me, you're crazy, nobody will pay that in San Francisco. I said, you know what, you're right, let's make it 200. But, but jokes aside, it, it, the only, we're the third most expensive building in the country. Mm -hmm. um, probably only after one Vanderbilt and 425 Park on average, we are the third most expensive building. But we're in the only historic building. Those two are brand new buildings. Right. We're the only building outside New York City that ever achieved a two-handle. So the answer is no. Nobody, forget about San Francisco, no, no other market beside New York has ever seen these numbers. How confident are you about the rest of the building? And you know, do you feel like there's going to be this culture? Like there's certain buildings, like the G GM building, yeah. people feel like they have to be there. Like, do you feel like you're going to create that culture here in San Francisco? Because there's not a building in San Francisco that has that appeal right now. Hundred percent. The, the answer is yes. Yes, I believe that that people want to be here, and people are going to want to be here, and the tenants that are renting want to be here because there is no other building. There's no other option. You know, in New York, you, even in New York, you still have the option. If it's one Vanderbilt or 425 Park or maybe the GM building or Nine West, there's no other options here. Right. It's us or, or, or everything else is very, uh, um, it's, it's, just, it's just a vanilla product. It's, it's, a, it's an everyday product. Are you getting tenants who are sort of taking advantage of the commercial market in general and saying like, hey, when, they're, when it comes time to renew, like you mentioned that some people can't afford to yeah. renew because simply you're asking for a different kind of... A it's a different rent. building. It's, it's not a that. Building. It's just a different building today from when they signed at least 10 years ago. But are you getting people who are, you know, who are asking for negotiating better rates or better terms because of the state of commercial? Again, we're, we're, our rents are two to three times higher. I don't know what better rent is. 
the people that are coming here are paying to be in the best building in San Francisco. That's it. Nobody's good. This is not. This is not where you come to get. You know, to get bargains. Is, has the city itself has it um, disappointed you? In the you know, obviously San Francisco has a lot of issues. I know, you know the the the, the mayor's office, the old one and the new one, have they've been very supportive of you? Yeah. But in general, do you feel like uh, the city could do more to uh, you know create an environment where you, you don't get all these bad headlines? So first thing, the city, any city, can always do more. We've been very fortunate because the city has been great to us, right? Both from a from a development point of view, from a zoning. We just got, you know, we just got a, at the end of last year, we got approved three Trans America as a new development. It, it got approved at the fastest I think time ever for for a new building. Norman Foster himself came to present to, to city planning, and they were mesmerized by 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 the building. So we get this question a lot because there's San Francisco has a reputation of being difficult mm -hmm. uh, for development. We've We've been very fortunate, um, but obviously we also own the Transamerica Pyramid, so it's not a it's not a fair comparison. Um, look, th there's obviously San Francisco has challenges. It had challenges, you know, it has challenges that are, have to do with security and homelessness. It got much better. I was with the mayor yesterday. I'm, I've been very vocal about what my opinion, what needs to get done. But you're here. You walk through the city. There's energy. There's yeah. people are, are people are here. People are here in downtown. Um, very different than what it was, you know, in 2020 after COVID in 2021. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were some really dark days in the city. Yeah. And you think it's gotten better. But, and I feel like there's a, the city's, the city is on a clock to get the foot traffic back and to be more welcoming to businesses and to really try to enforce, you know, the rule of law, because uh, it felt like for a while that that wasn't, uh, that wasn't really being applied. And I feel like it can still improve a lot more, but I, at least I feel like the pendulum is sort of uh, moving in that the, direction. The pendulum changed. Look, it's also an election year, yeah. right? So, so the current mayor has to show what, what she's doing because obviously there, there is, there's competition now. But look, she's, she, she has, she, she's well-intended. Um, the reality is it's all judged by, by the results. We're in a better place than we were a year ago or two years ago. Some of it has to do with actions taken by the city. Some of it has to do with just where, where, where things stand because mm -hmm. the city was vacant. Yeah. When there's vacancy, there's no people, there's more crime. Yeah. Um, there's more people, there's less crime. So I think there's, there's multiple reasons why we're today in a better place. But San Francisco is an irreplaceable city. You know, so many times there was this conversation about the doom loop and it's over. And, and you know, the, um, obviously I've been very vocal about the fact that I think San Francisco is not only going to prosper, but it's going to do great. What I didn't expect is the boom of AI. So what we're seeing today is, is there's this bubbling in the city and you feel it and in, 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 of all these new companies coming together, coming with, with, you know, obviously with new ideas popping every day. We're the benefactor of the VCs and the hedge funds and kind of the, the Have the you top got tier. any of that business? We, we, business? We, we got the AI business at the, at the top level, like you said, investors in, in AI companies. Mm -hmm. To Transamerica, which is one of the three buildings I own on the site here, is a more affordable building. And that building, you know, has some of, of kind of the late, late stage startups. But we're seeing that the AI business It's like, the, it's like the invention of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about Johnny Az. I had dinner with Johnny a couple of nights ago at his house, and we're talking about, about kind of the future of AI. And, and it's, it's fascinating. What Johnny was saying is the speed of the growth, mm -hmm. of the speed of, of the, the evolution of AI is so fast. He said he has never seen in his career uh, um, a business that is just flying, that, that the evolution is happening so quick. Right. Like they can't catch up with, with where it's going. And San Francisco is the heart of it. Uh, you know, some of these firms that left California to go to Miami and Texas, they're actually closing down in those. Uh, and coming back. And coming back. You know, a lot of people don't realize it, but the Transamerica building is actually the Transamerica Pyramid building. And there's other buildings that are attached right. to it. So there's two other buildings. So how many square feet is each of the other buildings? Well, between the three, we have approximately 850,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. So... Obviously, we have the pyramid, which is which is the most famous building. Um, we also we own the entire the entire city block. So there's also a private park, the Redwood Park, which I think is the most important component here. Mm -hmm. um, we have a private park that I made a commitment to open it to, to being a public park and being a park that's all about 
art and culture we can talk about in a second. And but the lobby is very welcoming too. It's incredible. I've, it's, I've saw people just coming through and looking at the and books. Have, and, and having coffee and there's yeah. a coffee shop there. So this building, so I'll, I'll give you a bit of a history, right? The building was built by Transamerica Corporation um, in 19, was, they started construction in 1969, ended in 1972. Mm -hmm. The building um, was opened two weeks before I was born. Um, November, at the end of November, and I was born at the end of, uh, or at the end of November, I was born in December of, of 72. And uh, the building was welcoming. There was a, we're, we're actually, where you're sitting here on the 27th floor, where today's our Sky Lounge, there used to be um, an observatory. Mm -hmm. After September 11, this building locked down. Basically, it was all barricades around. They shut down the observatory. They shut down the second lobby. It was extremely unwelcoming. Mm -hmm. I remember when I came here to look at the building. It was on a Sunday. The broker wouldn't get out of bed to show me the building. So I tried to walk in. Yeah. I, was, I was turned away. Um, and for me, when, when you have such an icon, the first thing that I told my team is, while well, we bought the building, the building really belongs to the people of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. they, everybody feels like they own this. This is the symbol of the city. No different than the Golden Gate Bridge or the cable cars. So I made a commitment to the city. I stood here three and a half years ago and I said, this building will be given back to the people of San Francisco. Everything on the ground plane mm -hmm. is going to be open to the public. Everything up to and up is gonna be private. Because it was a question of what's private, what's public. We, we had internal discussions. So on the ground plane today, we, we opened the lobby. The whole thing is translucent. The whole thing, it's all, it's all glass. People come in, um, you know, it says there's a bookshop, there's a coffee shop, there's a, there's a flower shop. That's all open to the public. The park, right now we have three art shows going on. There's the Lalan show, yeah. um, it, a sculpture park. There's a Norman Foster show here um, called Vertical Cities. Who designed which, the building. Who designed the building. Yeah. I just did the, the, the remastering with me. A show of all his uh, uh, vertical cities, which is these the high rises. You should, mm -hmm. you know, we'll take a walk there. It's so fascinating. And then we have a show that's called Pyramid Dreams, which is probably the one my favorite. And I hate to say that, but uh, there's 1,200 drawings of children of San Francisco that um, that drew pictures of what they dream, what their ambition is to be when they grow up. Mm -hmm. And this is driven by a drawing that, that I did when I was nine years old, when I came back to Israel after being in America, of the Trans-America, myself next to the Trans-America Pyramid. Right. And for me, this was the American dream. And four so years you, later, I bought so the building. When you were, so when you were a kid, you drew the Trans-America building? Correct. I, so I came here in 19, there's pictures here, I came here in 1979 to the building for the first time. 1981, when I came back to Israel, we found the hand drawing that I made. Yeah. Um, which is me next to the pyram pyramid uh, building. And, and this symbolized for me the American dream. Right. Seeing the tenants who were here and seeing, you know, walking through the building now, they can't possibly think that they're going to pay the same rent for this space. I mean, again, I mean, the amenity yeah. spaces that you created, I mean, I walked the building, I walked the, the, the restaurant section of the place. It's, uh, I mean... It, so the ones who can't afford it are obviously they still want to be here, but the ones who can't afford it, they're going to. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. That, that's, that's part of life. I mean, if, if um, you know, again, those that can't afford it probably are not the right mix for the building. Right. A building is like a little city. You want to make sure that the people are here, the people that are going to be here at the, that are here at the lounge or at the gym or at the restaurant or at the bar are, are like-minded people. Right. And that is really important right. when, when, you, when, when you curate the building. So we're, I'm very focused, obviously, I, I meet every single tenant that, that rents space here. And how do you target, do you like uh, selectively target certain tenants and say, let, like, let me go talk to these guys and tell them why they should be in this building? There's some tenants that we go talk to them because mm -hmm. we think that they're a great addition to the tenants. We're getting tremendous amount of incoming just because, again, we are, we are first thing, we're the only new building, even though we're old. Yeah. We're the new building at San right. Francisco. Everything, is, everything on the inside is brand new. Um, and we're obviously extremely known and famous. So there's a lot of incoming. And particularly now with the completion of, you know, with opening the building, which we did last, yesterday, opening it to the public, opening the ground plane to the public, um, we've seen in the last probably six weeks yeah. an unbelievable tour activity. Like so we signed three leases here, um, ranging from 125 to 185 a foot in the, stand, in the middle part of the building. These rents are between two and a half to three times the rents that the building achieved on those floors right. when I bought the building in 2020. 
And that doesn't that rent doesn't exist anywhere else in San Francisco. It doesn't exist anywhere except New York City. Yeah. New, we are the only building that ever got two hundred dollar rents. Well, let's talk about some of your other markets, please. Right? So we talked about how you're in all these you know, uh, great cities. Uh, in New York City, you have the Mandarin Oriental uh, condominiums that's uh, going on, and you were going to put a club in there, and you had the condominiums and the condos. Uh, you, you've sold ten condos so far. Is no, that, that's not true. No, we, tell me. It's in, in New York? Yeah. In New York, we've, we've sold around 30% of the building is sold, or 32% of the building is sold at 5400 bucks a foot. 5400 a foot, you're selling the Mandarin area. Closed and sold units, closed, yeah. if you check Street Easy, like yeah. you check uh, um, uh, CoStar. Today, actually, 20, an hour ago, we just closed the refinancing of, uh, of an inventory loan there yeah. for $120 million with Northwind. Um, and we're... we're Moving forward and selling units, right. we are. You know, part of the business is always the question of the velocity and the pricing, and there's you know different people that have different opinions. And I, I think it's important. It's to address not a big this. project. It's sixty four units, right? It's sixty four units, correct? And 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 what, what? How many units have you sold so far? Surprised with the just over a third of the building. Yeah. Um, we're in a very unique business, and when you talk about business that appeals to the upper echelon. Mm -hmm. We're at fifty-four hundred dollars a foot sold in closed unit. Think about that number. Mm -hmm. Look at other buildings in the neighborhood, even on on Billionaires Row, right. that don't achieve those numbers. We are on fifty-four and Fifth Avenue. We are a Mandarin product. We have turnkey residences. It's a very unique product, but worth fifty-four hundred bucks a foot. When you achieve these numbers, you can't expect to sell at the velocity of somebody selling a thirty-five hundred dollar uh, a foot product. Think about. Mercedes versus Rolls Royce, okay, mm -hmm. or, or Bugatti. Mm -hmm. We are the Rolls Royce of real estate. We're about selling at higher prices, slower pace, but achieving huge numbers. Mm -hmm. We're not in the Mercedes business, which is great. There's nothing bad about being but Mercedes. How, how do your lenders feel about that, though? Because, you know, obviously, the Mandarin Oriental in Los Angeles, your lenders uh, forced you to do a bulk sale. Or, that's not, know. that's also, that's incorrect. That is, uh, that's actually, that's completely incorrect if you want to address Beverly Hills. So Beverly Hills, we finished the construction on the building in May of this year, mm -hmm. a few months ago, four months ago. And we have a loan of around $200 million from Acor. And we've sourced a new loan through, uh, um, through Aaron Appel, actually, of $206 million from J.P. Morgan. Mm -hmm. After discussions with our partners, we made a decision, instead of closing the J.P. Morgan loan, to go ahead and sell the units of bulk, obviously less than what we would sell the individual units, yeah. because the decision was, let's move money away from condo developments into office building. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting decision that, that I'm in 100% support of, and I'll tell you why. And this came from me, predominantly. I believe that this, in the next 24 months, it's another amazing opportunity to buy office buildings, no different than the opportunity that I had when I bought, you know, the Coca-Cola building or, or, or 530 Broadway or this building, we're at a very, we're at a tipping point of, of, of the market right now. Mm -hmm. Interest rates right now are still high. Cap rates are very high. Mm -hmm. Office is super negative. Yeah. All, so, so basically you say to yourself, why are you buying office? You're buying office because in 48 months, anything you buy today for a dollar is going to be worth two dollars for a simple reason cap rates will go to half yeah or will go down 40 percent because you know already the fed is dropping interest rate yeah so you don't have to be michael schvo you don't have to be a mirror to to figure that out right so we know interest rates are going down buildings were going to be worth double than what they are today now if you can add to that what we do which is called double rents and buildings we can create a 4x on values of building from today so the decision was Let's go, take money, deploy it into office, into the office market in the next 24 months, yeah. buy more office buildings, and do what we did, exactly what we did here. So for the LA, the Mandarin uh, there, so you decided to put uh, the units up for bulk sale? Correct, with Newmark. Newmark. Correct. And uh, the idea is to sell that, and then take the money and reallocate it for Correct. commercial buildings. Correct, and we'll is, sell for less money, by the way. Which uh, is very, you know, tough, because nobody's talking about buying more commercial right now, obviously. But look, you're, this is, I guess these are the times where you do go in. When everybody's pulling out, you go in. You, you make money not by following the crowds. Yeah. When you follow the crowds, it's too late. Yeah. Um, but 
this is not so revolutionary. I mean, this is very simple. Everybody knows today interest rates are going down. You know, the Fed told you already that the interest rates are going down. You just have to believe that the office market is not totally dead. Right. And in what we do in the top tier flight to quality product, the office market is booming. Class A office at the super prime is at an all time high rents and occupancy. But so are you somewhat frustrated with the condo market? Because look, I, in New York, you're selling at, uh, at a slow pace, but at, at the rest of the market is, right? Like, especially at no, that it, price. No, it's, it's, it's not true. Again, this is a misconception of here. I'm selling slower than anybody else because I'm selling at, at double the prices. Right. It, it, there's, there's a function between price and speed. So, yes, we're selling slower, but it's part of the business plan. I could sell at half the price and sell at double the speed. We sell a product that is scarce, mm -hmm. and that's why we're selling at a higher price, and that's why we sell it slower, because there's in, in inherently less people that are buying condos at 5,400 bucks a foot than at 3,500 bucks a foot. But are you f frustrated with the condo market in general? Because uh, No, I'm not, fr I'm not frustrated with the condo market at all. I'm, 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 the condo market, look, it's a, lot, it's a lot more difficult to go build a condo, sell it, um, just from, a, from, a, from the amount of resources that it takes. But right now, the opportunity in the office building is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah I, I see it like I, like I see you today. And I, you know, I, I, I say these things, I say it on camera. So in two years, somebody can't say, well, you said it after the fact. I'm telling you right now, go buy office buildings. Go buy super prime office buildings because these buildings are going to outperform the market in 48 months. Right. But um, so with, just with the LA uh, product, that's, you're going to put that out there. You wanna, it's out already. You want to you be out of that. Basically. We made a decision to exit that project again at, at a bulk sale of the units at less at a less at a lesser dollar in order in order to not sit there for another two years and sell condominiums. Two follows to that. Um, the Fairmount in the Fairmont in Century City, did that put pressure on that product in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills? In what way? In the sense that they were putting out the condos in the same—I mean, not at the same price, I guess—but uh, you know, they, you know, they were, they were adding more product. To That's the like asking, right? Toyota came out with a new model. Does that affect the Rolls Royce Phantom? I, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's literally the answer. The, okay. But what was? What do you think was the essential problem with the LA product? There's no problem in LA product. L LA market well, in general the, is a slower market. The product, if there wasn't a product, then you wouldn't have done a bulk sale. But because LA, is, LA in general is a slower market when it comes to condominiums. And, and inherently, because it's not a market that, that sells condominiums all day. We, we sold and closed units are at 3250 a foot. We're the highest selling product in the market. Yeah. Okay, we're, I, I believe we are the best product delivered in the market. Amon is building and they'll, they'll do an amazing job there. And do you think they will? I, I think that, the, look, Foster designed the building. I think it's a beautiful building. You're years out, and they're selling units. They're, they're asking $7,000 a foot. Okay. So do, it's do, a different market. Do you think that uh, Southern California like uh, audience wants to live in towers? Because like you said, I, they prefer to, I feel like they prefer to live in homes. Like the people I talk to, the people I meet with there, they all live in homes. Nobody lives in a condo. So it's geared, it's not, it's not as sophisticated as the New York market, but with obviously some of the safety concerns that, that over the last two, three years that, that, that Beverly Hills had, um, we're seeing people prefer to be in a more secure environment. And the people that, that are buying there are like and at the Mandarin in Beverly Hills, it divides the two. One group is called the pied -a Um People that are outside the market that just want to be in, in Beverly Hills. You know, yeah. the 90210 is a, is a, is a, is a brand. And the other thing is you have people in Beverly Hills that just kids grew older, they have a 20,000 square foot house with a husband and wife that's 60 years yeah. old and what are they going to do there? Um, so they buy themselves a condo and the condo could be 4,000 square feet. It's not, it's not that small. Um, and, and you can lock and go, yeah. which is nice about, the best thing about the Mandarin is I see everything the, is being taken care of. I see the appeal to it. I'm just saying like, I feel like that audience is not there. Even like some of the people who are, you know, empty nesters, I go to their house, you're right. You're living in a 7,000 square foot house and it's just like 260 something old. But, but there, there's definitely a market there. It's not as sophisticated as New York. And let's go, let's uh, go to another city that Shabo's there. So you're in, obviously- I hope you take me on the real deal, uh, um, you know. <laughs> On the, on, on, the, on the G7000. We are going to uh, Miami. 
you, you, you're doing the rally there, which is, again, another iconic uh, project. And I feel like this has been going on for a long time, right? Like the rally, I remember you announced it almost, was it four years ago or five years we ago? We bought the rally. So the rally was an interesting project. The rally is, is, a, is an assemblage of three properties. Mm -hmm. The rally is South Seas and Richmond. Um, it took me just under a year to buy them. Mm -hmm. So I believe that, again, don't hold me to the dates, but you know, considering that, that we're, we're having our whiskey here, Yes. Um, cheers, 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 cheers. Um, I'm doing much better than you are. Um, the, um, so, so we assembled, I've assembled three properties there, three acres on the ocean, all designed by interesting, the same architect, Elmer e. Dixon. And that was completed in, I believe, 2020. I spent a year and a half changing the zoning in Miami Beach. So when I bought the Raleigh and these properties, you were only allowed to build five stories. Yeah. With the change of the zoning, you were allowed to build 200 feet. That's why you're seeing today the Shore Club, the Ritz, and all these other projects pop up all of a sudden, and they're building towers. They all kind of rode the Michael Schwo, uh, uh rezoning of the historic district on Miami Beach. Um, so we did that, and that obviously obviously took, took, took quite a lot of time. So, so the entitlements is what – because – The entitlement took, took a very long time because I had to change the zoning. It's not, it's not typical. It's not like – the Mandarin in New York that I just went, designed the building, and it's, it's, per, it's, it's, um, it's as of right. I had to change the zoning there, mm -hmm. which took a long time. So we've been, we've been, took, took a year and a half, almost a year to assemble the assets and a year and a half to do entitlements. So it took two, two and a half years, more or less, from the time I bought the Raleigh until we were fully entitled, and then we had to obviously do the design and everything else. It's, it's, a, long, it's a long commitment and a long process. We started selling that, that project in December of last year, 2023, so around nine months ago. And how, many, how much have you sold so far? How, how, many, many how many units? It's a good question. I don't know. I'll get you the number. I really don't, don't remember the exact number. At, at, again, record, record prices. At record prices. Record. I mean, we've sold. What, what we, give me an idea of what the record is. So we, I believe that our average is just shy of 6,000 a foot. Wow. Again, record so the price. Oman is doing six thousand a foot too. There. Not in Miami. In the the amount is sold out. Yeah, but the amount sold out, I, I believe, don't hold me to it. I believe at either four thousand or just under. But they sold very quickly. Yeah, very quickly, um, and they sold the, a year and a half ago. So you were. They would have sold for more money today. You, you, how many units are at the Raleigh in total? Forty. Forty. But so you, you mentioned that in the past, you mentioned that you had sold up to two hundred fifty yeah. million. Your dollar was yes, I mean, the dollar is more or less two hundred fifty. What would you say? How many units is that in total, roughly? Let's see. Was there like a fifty million dollar sale? Or, there's you know? one. There's one sale that's sixty five million dollars. Um, that was actually bought by somebody that you know. I won't tell you who that is. Um, we we sold, I believe. The twenty, I think thirteen apartments, fourteen 13. apartments. So yeah. yeah, and that's it. So you have a, uh, you have a few more. Yeah, we, have, we yeah we have, we definitely have a few more to go. You you got a loan from a BH three that specializes in distress loans for the Raleigh for it's a six month loan that you got. Are no, you, no, I, no, I got a loan from BH three. No, I got a loan from BH three. Um, I got a loan from BH three a year and a year ago. And you got to, oh, for you 190 got million, and then we extended the loan now By for six another months. six months. Yeah, we have these loans have six months extension. It's, it was a year loan with uh, two six months extension. We exercised our, our our first option. Are you planning to continue with them and get another extension, or you want to refinance? Them? No, we're going to refinance them out. So well, the reason that we did this with BH3, you know, construction costs are are out the roof right now in Miami. When you build the Peter Marino building, which inherently costs you <laughs> double than what it costs any building. Um, you really sense like his design, so it's and, amazing. Yeah, and this is Peter is, you know, I'm very fortunate, by the way. Half my buildings today are designed by Peter, the other half by, by Norman Foster. Yeah, right. Now I'm trying to work on a collaboration between the two, which really would be, after that I can retire again. <laughs> um, so you, you asked about, about the loan. The BH, BH2 is actually by the way, great lenders. They're, 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 they're not, it's not accurate that they, they especially in distress, they are lenders. They, they've done some really smart distress moves. Um, but that's not, that's not, especially they have a, they have a debt fund. And what we've done is we've done a kind of 
or we separated our construction loan into two. We did a phase one construction loan, which was with them, which uh, was involved basically doing all the restoration of the historic buildings. We had to demolish all the non-historic elements of the building and do all the soil mixing and all the underground work, mm -hmm. which is that. And now we're doing all the um, excavation, foundation, and, and steel work. Once that is complete, we're going to refinance that um, to go vertical. So we split that into two because I believed, and I, I know today's obviously it was the right decision, interest rates I thought were going to go down, so we didn't want to take a larger loan at high interest rate, and construction costs are going to go down, mm -hmm. which we're seeing at least them leveling now. But um, back to the rally, this um, George Perez uh, related is said to have a position in the MES loan at the rally. and you know George uh, Perez? Yeah. No. He has no position no. in the rally. Right. No. But, no. Nobody. There's a BH3 loan. There's no mess. That's it. Do you feel confident that you're going to make money on that project? 100%. On the rally? You feel 100%. Good? Yeah. A lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> How much money? How much money will it make? Well, we'll have to see in the end. That's good. Um, in terms of uh, insurance, it seems to be a very big problem for uh, Florida in general, but especially in Miami. Yes. Uh, you have two other projects that are about to go live, uh, two uh, commercial projects in, in Miami. You haven't started on those yet. We've, so we have the Alton and we have one soundscape. Yeah. Um, the Alton, we, are, we finished our entitlements on the Alton. Right now we're, doing, we're in the process of doing the, the construction drawings on, on those and we're pricing them um, for GMP. Once we get that, we will, we will move forward. Um, and um, on one soundscape, we got our entitlements done very recently, and we're working more or less on the same schedule. Yeah. But I, insurance, you tell, those have nothing to do with insurance. Insurance costs everywhere, not only in, in Florida. Or, or Florida, California, are especially feeling it because you had like the top 25 uh, insurers leave those markets. Correct. But insur insurance, and, and even New York, I mean, insurance costs have gone, have gone out there. I mean, it's, it's very challenging. You asked about development. That's part of the problem with development. Insurance costs for, 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 for development are crazy. Is, uh, would you consider, you know, since you haven't started on those projects and you have your hands full with this project in New York and, uh, you know, in other markets and you're talking about buying new buildings, uh, would you consider selling those, uh, uh, the, the, those sites? You know, we are not attached to anything yeah. um, except the Transamerica Pyramid. But the, um, the, it's interesting you say that. So three weeks ago, I got an unsolicited offer for the Alton. That's what I'm site. asking you about. This. I, got, I got a very, a very attractive offer. Um, spoke to my partners about it. Um, and look, for the right price, of course, we would, we would exit. Because if you can make the money by selling it and not going through development, we would do it. Um, on the Alta, we would have to run a process because, again, we're, we're partners with, with German uh, institutions that require a process. So we would think about it. We got an offer. We're considering what to do right now. Yeah. So you would consider moving out of those two projects? No, not one soundscape we wouldn't sell. The Alton, possibly. And especially hearing about like uh, companies who were super excited about moving their headquarters to Miami and not pulling back. It does give you, it does give you. You know, you know I'm laughing because there was a, all these things, you know, the, you remember, the, the, it, it's no different than, than, than how you guys report. Everybody's moving to Miami. You remember that moment? <laughs> Everybody's moving. Forget about it. Can, San Francisco's dead. LA is dead. My, New York is dead. Everybody's moving to Miami. They're abandoning. And I'm sitting there by myself with the flag saying, guys, you're out of your mind. It's never going to happen. And you see that, that these extremes don't happen. Right. It's no different than people working from home. Yeah. I told you that when we were sitting at COVID, you and I in our own homes and talking to each other. Well, there was, you know, we had our forum yesterday and there's like a lot of frustration about people coming back to work because it, the difference between the people, not the, you know, the companies where the people are not at the office versus the ones who do go to the office, it's, you know, it's starting to show, especially with the, you know, new tech companies. I was talking to Spencer Raskoff, yeah. you know, who, you know, they, they have everybody come in. So, and these projects are very small anyways. I mean, it's 62,000 square foot, the commercial building. Well, the, 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 the Alton is a big project. The Alton is a quarter million square feet. Um, one soundscape is around 62,000. By the way, for Miami, for Miami Beach, a yeah. quarter million square foot office Huge. building, I control 75% of all commercial class A offices in Miami Beach. If you built this. Right, and yeah. that's, that's 350,000 feet that I'm building, a plus minus, you know, 325. 
And let's talk about some of the uh, salacious headlines that were that have been in the news recently. By who? By the real deal. By the real deal. By the New York Post and you know some of those other sons of bitches. Maybe we should maybe but, we should read the other newspapers. <laughs> should but, read, uh, we should read the San Francisco news but, that are very I, very cute, that are very non salacious. But I was uh, you, know, you know yesterday there was an article that just said there was an article there was I forgot who wrote this yesterday here that that Michael Spau's dream became a reality. Oh Jesus Christ. Who wrote that? Your publicist? No. I, <laughs> it was a real deal. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm uh, tapping into your booze. I shouldn't probably do this. Please do. There's, we need this for this, you know. No, but there's, it's Friday uh, afternoon. But I want to also talk about... Please. Uh, so, okay, so the core club. They, you know, I was very surprised when I saw that lawsuit. Uh, so was I. So, so they, you know, this is a company that you brought in. They're, it's a social club. You brought in, you wanted to sort of reformat them. They were, you know, they had a, a position at one of A.B. Rosen's buildings. I forget where it was. But it was a very small club. And you wanted to reposition them in something really nice in the Midtown Manhattan at the Coca-Cola building. Yeah. And, uh, and I saw in the lawsuit that they said that uh, you, you over-promised and under-delivered. And then they sued you for $600 million. I didn't realize there was anything the core club was doing that was value that that so what is the 600 million dollars that they're suing you for for actually because I, I don't think the entire core club if it was to be you know i, I don't know it, 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 what what was the 600 million dollar lawsuit for i think that there was a typo and they added two zeros by mistake <laughs> um i have no idea it's the whole thing is the whole thing is somewhat ludicrous because if you actually read the lawsuit and you read our um our reply they're suing me because they said that I promised them something verbally, mm -hmm. but they don't tell you when and where or what I said. Our reply was, here's the leases that you signed, here's the loan that I gave you that you never paid, and here's the option agreement that you signed. They won't. So, I don't know. So you're in a position to actually have ownership in the core club, if, it, right? Because part of the agreement was well, that you... Well, I, I could have ownership or I can I could basically, you know go after the guarantor, which in essence will bankrupt the business, it, which is not my intent, by the way. The, the, the last thing, you know, I, I have any desire was to, is to, is to, is to hurt our, our, our tenants in that sense. But it's unfortunate that, that after everything that we've done for Core Club, um, they elected to, to, to take these actions. But, you know, it's, you know, when you develop, when you have a $5 billion portfolio, um, there's certain, you know, it's it's it, it, it's it's part of the course of doing business. I'm 100 percent sure that we're going to prevail, um, and you know, and and if you actually read the documents, I think that it's very clear that 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 one side is 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 making claims that are some verbal claims, and the other side, which is our side, is is all documented. Is is this something that you think as business owners, uh, the core club? Because obviously it's a major partnership for them to be at the Transamerica in San Francisco would be major for them to be at the Coca-Cola building. Correct. Uh, is this something that you think they did to try to sort of renegotiate? And I, I bring this up because of who their attorney is. But is this something that you think they did to try to renegotiate the deal that we, they have with you? Because over the course of the 20 years, they were supposed to pay you $180 million in, uh, in rent. So... <laughs> the, the, again, if you read, and then I assume that you're saying that because you read our, our, our motion to dismiss, and according to our motion to dismiss, what we said is, yes, we believe that, that we know, because that's the ask, is, is, to, is to renegotiate uh, the rent. Now, well, it's very simple. You sign a lease, you have to, in, in, in the world where I come from, in the world where my, my partners come from, um, which are all German institutions, if you sign a document, you have to abide by your lease. Now we understand that they might have some some issues, you know, of of, of performance there, but you know, going going and suing your landlord is not going to get you anything. But but you know, do you but, think there's a path at, forward for you guys? It's very simple. If they comply with their lease, then they will be tenants. If they don't comply with the lease, they will not be tenants. There's, it's very black and white in our world. Do you think this is a way for them to get out of the lease because there has been so many social clubs that have opened up? Recently, I, you would have to ask them, but th there is no way to get out of the lease. <laughs> they have a liability. I just said it's one hundred eighty million dollars. If they decide that they're not going to pay the eighteen million dollars that they're supposed to pay here in order to build their club, because that was their contribution, they will 
and they will be responsible for their entire lease obligation, which I'm, I highly doubt that they can that they can afford, but maybe they can. If they sue me for $600 million, you're right. I mean, maybe they, maybe they can write me a $180 million check up front, and, you know, and I we'll have... I didn't realize the value of the club could be that much, but this is another thing I found very interesting. This same lawyer that they used to deal with this very complex 20-year-old lease is who happens not to be a real estate attorney, is also the lawyer that another tenant had used in, on, the, on the condo side to sue you. So it's both of these people, one is dealing with, one is to sued you because he said uh, you built too many closets in the condo building, and one is suing you for $600 million because they said you, but then they're using the same lawyer. Did you find that, uh, like that coincidence, sort of a too, little, little too on point? Yeah, it's Friday afternoon. Uh, um, we're having a beautiful whiskey here. The, um, you know, I think that you answered your own question. Like I said, both of these, we believe that both of these lawsuits, uh, um, you know, will, will, will get dismissed um, because, again, we our, our 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 position is that, and we've shown that that we have delivered on documents that we've signed. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes. Which is only the, the, the which is the only thing that matters in the world of, in the world of business. If you sign a lease, you have to abide by a lease. If you sign a floor plan, you have to deliver a floor plan. That is basically it. But it just seems like if you're going to come after your landlord, you would use a real estate attorney to talk about the lease that was happening. Do you think this was in a case where the attorney went to them and they were like, hey, you know, here's a, here's I, a big I, fish? I'm, I'm, I'm curious because like it's very coincidental that the same two people, the two lawsuits that you're involved in have the same attorney. The only two lawsuits I've the ever only? been involved in, by the way. Just ever? Think, yeah, <laughs> but it, it, yeah, I've never been sued by anybody else. Well, but there was, a, but in this case, you have these two headline lawsuits and the same attorney who's not a real estate attorney is uh, manning them, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. But um, all right, let's, let's talk about, you know, you, you came to New York, you were a taxi dispatcher. I, I, I know you don't like to talk about this stuff because it's been done before and it's a little, you know, but I just want to go through this uh, timeline. You came to New York City, you were a taxi dispatcher, and you were like, hey, real estate looks cool. Let me try to do like Almost, but yeah, not not exactly, so, but okay. And then you come in, and you're like, uh, a real estate in the early 2000s in New York City was incredibly clicky, incle- incredibly clubby. There was no MLS, there was no street easy. If you didn't have access to the right people and the right circles, you just did not get in. But you were always in a hurry to get to where you were going, and you were like, I don't have time to for these people to figure things out. And in a matter of four years, you became one of the top real estate brokers in uh, New York. And then soon after that, you were like, well, you know, it's, real estate is not, uh, you know, brokerage is not the thing. Development is the thing. And then you, you started your development consulting business. You did that. And then, you, you know, the great uh, financial crisis happened. You took some time off. And then you came back sort of, you know, you disappeared. And then you came back. And then you came back with, uh, you know, a massive bank account, uh, you know, support with Deutsche Finance, who they said that like, hey, we're going to start investing through Michael Schwo, yeah. billions of dollars, somebody who has no experience doing this size deals, doing commercial office for, for that matter. Why you? Why did they pick you to do that when there's so many other experienced developers who could have like come in and, you know, manage that money for them? You know, it's the same reason that when you came to me with your first or second edition with a real deal, I gave you 10 ads. Yeah. Because you have faith in the person that you do business with. I mean, it's really that, 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 that's, that's really the, 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 the I belief think I have. bankers work that way. But it's, it's, it's not, again, your, 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 your description of the, of the, of the history and, and it, it's, it's more or less accurate, but there's some nuances. It's so the first thing I've done development before that, obviously, but look, what, we are a very focused, Schwo is a very focused business. And Schwo focuses on, as I said, elevating super prime real estate in order to elevate people's lives. And what investors want is developers or partners that are focused. They don't want people that are all over the place. Mm-hmm. You know, you have these guys that have opportunistic funds. What does that mean? One day I can do a rental building in, in Minnesota. The other day I can do an office building in New York. The other day I can do a warehouse in, in, in Texas. That's not who we are. Mm-hmm. We address a very specific need. 
which is solving the issues of the of the super wealthy, giving product, uh, creating product at the office or or retail or hospitality for a very specific client. And that's the reason they invested with me because they believed that the thesis of super prime real estate uh, um, and, and the flight to quality is what's going to survive over years. And it's a very safe investment, which as you can see, it is because over COVID, the only thing that really survived is, is super prime real estate. Coupled with the fact that I'm, I was adamant that we, uh, we, we do projects with very low debt mm-hmm. ratio, right? Our, our, our portfolio debt is sub 50%, which is very not normal for, for developers because they want to sleep at night. Yep. Um, they like the, they like very much the, the thesis. They like the, the, the vision and I ma- and I can deliver and I did deliver one after the other, the best properties in the United States. If it's 685 Fifth Avenue, which is, you know, a building on Fifth Avenue, 54th Street, the Transamerica Pyramid, the Raleigh and Miami Beach, just to name a few, the access to the deals was something that nobody else could deliver to mm-hmm. So I think that that is, again, you should obviously ask them, but I can tell you that from a relationship point of view, we brought something to, to the German uh, institutional market that really doesn't exist, which is I, access to the best, the best deals out there. I still feel like that doesn't really, that's not enough. I mean, you're talking about bill, you, what, how much, the, the over, uh, over $4 billion. Dollars yeah, four and a half billion dollars that we, the, of properties that we bought over a three-year period. I think New York City is, is again, I've said this many times, New York City is still the, the, the center of this. Is, is, is there anything you've identified that, because you said that I've you tried, I, 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 yeah, I tried, I tried to buy another building on Fifth Avenue six months ago. Which one was it? Um, um, 717. I failed. Uh, six months, maybe eight months ago, before they started the renovation, I failed. That's the Harry Winston building, right? Is no, that's the, across the street. Yeah, okay. Um, owned by, by a ch- Chinese conglomerate. Um, I failed. I tried. Um, wanted to own the building. It's the next door building to 7-Eleven Fifth Avenue. Right. Um, couldn't, couldn't come to terms with the uh, seller. They weren't real sellers. So sometimes we will target specific buildings that we try to buy. There was a, there was a, a not too long ago, you guys, I think, or somebody reported that we I was, re- that I was trying to buy. Was 57th. Right. I can't confirm or deny. It's a great building. Um, great building. Great building. Um, and, and th- there's, but, but we're, we're very active. Um, I would buy again, there's a specific property in San Francisco that I would love to buy. Yeah. Um, if I could get a hold of it, I would buy it. Again, it's hard in San Francisco when you, after you own this building, there's one more building in San Francisco, one more property or campus that, that, that I'm very interested in acquiring here. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you folks. And, uh, tune in again for another coffee talk.